I'm Indy Nidell, and this is Out of the Foxholes, where I sit here, sort of near my chair of infinite knowledge, but uh, next to my mugs of infinite knowledge. Yeah, sure. And answer your questions about the Second World War. Let's go. Uh, the first one comes from Peter Speroni, a captain in the Time Ghost Army. Now, you should remember that questions from members of the Time Ghost Army have priority, and captains like Peter get guaranteed answers. So Peter asks, Hey, Indy, I have a question for Out of the Foxholes. Could you talk about the Chinese warlords? I'm referring to Yan Shishan, Li Zongren, uh, Sheng Shikai, Ma Bufeng, and Long Yun. Were they independent warlords ruling over different parts of China? Were they part of the Guangdong CCP? How did they contribute to the war against Japan? Well, the complex reality of Chinese warlord politics, it's difficult to explain succinctly, so I can only give you a general overview, but you should check out our Between Two Wars uh, series on the Time Ghost History Channel. The playlist uh, East Asia in the interwar years has a more de detailed explanation for that. So you can click the link even for that, probably, that's popping up right now if our editors are really cool. <laughs> Otherwise, it'll just be below, right? But anyhow, um, the warlord era officially ended in 1928 when Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek more or less unified China under the rule of his Kuomintang party, the KMT. China was hardly at peace, though, because the civil war with Mao Zedong's Communist Party was just getting started. Plus, the warlords continued to hold, and in fact still continue to hold here in 1943, a great deal of power across the country. Warlords even make up some of Chang's top generals. Two of them, Chang Shui Liang and Yang Hu Cheng, orchestrated the Xi'an incident in 1936, where they kidnapped Chang and forced him to create a united front with Mao against the Japanese. Now that put a temporary hold on the civil war, but the front is only really united in name. The network of alliances and loyalties between the warlords and the competing governments is much more complicated. Now the warlords you mentioned, they all play different roles in this. Most of them wield the real power in their regions, not the KMT and not the communists. Some of them even govern their regions as de facto independent states. Take Sheng Shikai, who ran Xinjiang as a Soviet puppet state for much of the 1930s and stayed uninvolved in the war against Japan. In 1942, Sheng expected the Soviet Union to fall to the Axis powers. So he switched to the nationalist side and expelled Soviet personnel. By now, in later 1943, the Soviet presence is virtually eliminated, allowing Sheng to even order the arrest and even the execution of communists in Xinjiang. Notoriously, this includes Mao Zedong's brother, Mao Zemin. We have actually a World War II Instagram day-by-day -day post about this in late September, so keep an eye out for that. Um, Ma Bufeng has a similar level of power in King Hai. He has long preached ethnic peace in the region commanding multi-ethnic brigades in his armies. In 1937, his Turkic Muslim soldiers were some of the first to engage the Japanese in the defense of Beijing. And that same year, actually, his forces were incorporated into the 82nd Army, and that played an important role in defending Lanzhou against multiple Japanese incursions throughout the war. Um, well, there's also Li Zongren. Li has been a respected figure in the KMT since his military victories against Northern warlords back in the 1920s. In the period leading up to the Civil War, he was known as a strong anti-communist, and his forces played a, a big role in the April 1927 purge, where left-wing members of the KMT and members of the CCP were purged by conservative factions in the KMT. Li and Chang have hardly been buddies, however. Their rocky relationship led to Li resigning his post in 1929 and establishing the influential Guangxi clique, a, a group of military leaders ruling over southern China. The fighting in 1937 motivated Chang to enlist Li's military expertise once again, promoting the respected general to the leader of the KMT Fifth War Zone. Li is repeatedly recognized as the most capable nationalist general 
by the communist officers of the United Front. He brilliantly orchestrated the defense of Tai Shuang in 1938, luring the Japanese into a trap and, and annihilating them, giving China one of its first major victories of the war. But Chang still has reservations about Li's loyalties, and so earlier this year, 1943, he made him director of the Generalissimo's headquarters. This means forced retirement in the field for Li. Okay, that's just three of the warlords, but you can see they do play critical roles in China's fight against Japan, and, you know, they're not alone. The next question comes from another Time Ghost Army captain. Okay, Siobhan Shebnisky. Shebnisky? Shebnisky asks, What role did the Royal Canadian Navy play in the Battle of the Atlantic? If you need something more specific, what role did the Royal Canadian Navy play in the Battle of the Atlantic, especially in the Newfoundland and Mid-Ocean Escort Forces? Okay. Well, right at the beginning of the war, there wasn't much of an RCN to speak of. Canada had six destroyers, five minesweepers, and like, like three and a half thousand men, including the reserve force. Luckily, the German U-boats were focusing their efforts far from Canadian waters. There were real fears that this might change given a large enough expansion of the U-boat fleet, so the RCN had to build up, and build up they very much did. In early 1940, the Canadian authorities ordered the building of 94 warships, more than eight times what the country possessed. When the Kriegsmarine did start reaching out beyond British waters, this newly developed RCN was able to deter them from attacking too close to the Canadian coast. A new naval base was also built at St. John's, Newfoundland. Well, Newfoundland is under direct rule from Britain at this time, right? Since 1933. But the RCN will use this as their main hub for transport ships across the Atlantic. The new Newfoundland Escort Force was formed out of this base, consisting of six destroyers and 17 corvettes from the RCN, and seven destroyers and four corvettes from the Royal Navy. The expansion of the Canadian Navy during World War II is really impressive. By the war's end, so big spoiler, Canada will have the fourth largest navy in the world. Needless to say, the RCN has a vital role in escorting convoys. It does not take a leading role in U-boat hunting, though, because its, its weaponry and detection technology lagged behind the Royal Navy so far, 1943. So before this year, it's mainly just supported British ships in that role. Its rapid expansion also means it suffers from having a lot of inexperienced Navy personnel and, and, and a real lack of equipment. Still, the RCN has been dutifully protecting British and Canadian transports on the Newfoundland-New York route. Some ships also provide protection to merchant vessels going all the way to Britain. Canada has also fought engagements in its home waters. On May 11, 1942, eight minutes before midnight, the passenger ship SS Nicoya was sunk by U-553, starting the Battle of St. Lawrence. The engagements mainly consist of U-boats trying to attack vulnerable merchant vessels, with the RCN deterring them most of the time. In total, about 23 merchant ships and four Canadian warships will be sunk over the long course of the battle. The last attack will take place during the night and early morning of November 24th and 25th, 1944, when the corvette HMS Shawnigan is hit by a U-boat. 91 crewmen will be lost, including a former professional hockey player, Dudley Red Garrett. Let's see, after that, no more ships will be sunk in the Gulf of St. Lawrence in the war. The U-boats entering those waters are doing more than just trying to sink vessels, though. They're also trying to drop off and pick up spies, uh, one of them is Werner von Janowski, who entered Canada November 9th, 1942, and he was pretty much immediately caught because the locals saw his European apparel. They thought that was suspicious and promptly reported him. So he was arrested before he could carry out any sort of espionage operations. Well, that is a quick look, a very quick look, of what the Royal Canadian Navy is doing during the Battle of the Atlantic. And that is everything for this installment of Out of the Foxholes. If you'd like to learn more about how the Allies in general fought back against U-boats, you can watch our How to Kill a U-boat video right here. 
And if you have a question you'd like answered, and I know you do, you can ask it on community.timeghost.tv. Not here in the comments. Not here in the comments. Community.timeghost.tv. If you'd like your question to be priority, prioritized, prioritized or to have a guaranteed answer, then join the Time Ghost Army at timeghost.tv or patreon.com. And that's about all I have to say. Um, maybe the editors can insert an image of what it does to us when you ask us questions in the comments instead of at community.timeghost.tv, right? Okay, here it is. It's, oh, that looks horrible. Oh, God, don't do that. See you next time.